Let's look at verse number 12 very quickly. And we'll read down through verse number 20 of Ezekiel chapter number 14. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, and I will break the staff of the bread thereof, and I will send famine upon it, and I will cut off man and beast from it. So these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land, and they spoil it, so that it be desolate, that no man may pass through because of the beast. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Or if I bring a sword upon that land, and say, Sword, go through the land, so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Or if I send a pestilence into that land, and pour out my fury upon it in blood, to cut off from it man and beast, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. We see here God speaking through his, to his man, through his man, about his judgment. And friend, the judgment of God is a very real thing. Boy, we need a revival, not just in, in this world, but we need a revival amongst God's people at the realization that God's judgment is real. And friend, as you just preached about staying in your place, there's judgment when we disobey God. There's judgment when we leave God. Well, as I look at uh, the condition of our land, then I understand that God is speaking to His people here, but we look at our land, and I don't know if we're facing the judgment of God, but I believe we are. I believe there's some lines that can be crossed, and if there's a nation that's ever crossed them, you can only murder babies for so many years before a loving and a gracious and a long-suffering God, and I thank God for His grace, and I thank God for His mercy, and I thank God for His long-suffering nature, but there comes a point in time when God says, you've crossed the line. And it is a dangerous thing when that line is crossed. With this nonsense that we see in our society today of how many genders are there and you can be whatever you want to be friend God doesn't deal with rainbows and unicorns when it comes to his divine will but what it is is a rebellion against God our leaders are not senile they're reprobate they have reprobate minds we have a reprobate society and friend it ought to drive us to our knees trembling and in fear because of the judgment of God. We find God establishing some things with Ezekiel. He says if I send judgment, there's nothing nobody can do about it. It's done. Well, what a sobering passage of Scripture. I look at our nation, and it's sobering to see what I would believe is the judgment of God. But I don't want to take the time I have this morning to speak specifically on what has brought that judgment you and I can probably take do that very very easily this morning I don't even want to spend my time focused on the severity and the and what all that means but I want to look in this passage of scripture this morning in a serious passage of scripture where God hands down and says this is what I am going to do I, I find hope in the midst of God's judgment. Our nation deserves the judgment of God. I don't like it, 
but we deserve it. But I find if we, if we look in this passage as God reminds us who He is and reminds us that there's lines to be crossed, that can be crossed, I want us to see verse 14. Those these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. As I was reading this passage of Scripture not too long ago, and I was taking note of the things that I've just mentioned, of the judgment of God, and how sad and tragic for God's people who've been blessed by God, and His hand has been upon them to get to a place where God would judge them, and the heaviness of what's going on in our society and our world you see hope in Noah, Daniel, and Job, and I take note of that. God said, when I send my judgment, there's nothing anyone can do about it. Matter of fact, if Noah, Daniel, and Job were here, I would not spare the land, although they would spare themselves. He references that again, and we see in verse 18, he says, Though these three men were in it as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither their sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Yeah. Or 5 verse 19, If I send a pestilence in that land and pour out my fury upon it, or blood to cut off from it man and beast, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it. Yeah. They could not stop yep. the judgment but they could be delivered. Friend, as I look at our nation, our land, I stand here today, I don't believe you can stop the judgment of God. My family can be delivered. I believe my church could be delivered. As we look at this and we see these three men. I ask the question. I have a very logical mind. I want to say, okay, what is it about Noah? What is it about Daniel? What is it about Job? Where God obviously has favor towards them. There's obviously a record of them being delivered. We know of their faith. We know the fact that all three of these men had to face things alone. They faced peril, their lives and their, their, their ministry and their livelihood and their families all were at risk and yet they still kept faith in God. Amen. Friend, it doesn't matter what inflation does, it doesn't matter what nonsense comes out of Washington, D.C. God is still on His throne. This book is still true. God's people should still be holy and we can find favor at the hand of God. As we look at these three men, turn with me to the book of Genesis very, very quickly. Genesis chapter number 6. We don't have time to look at all three of those men, but I want us to notice a few things about Noah this morning. What made Noah great in the mind of God? Noah, I mean, God destroyed the world, but he spared Noah. God references him again when he's going to send his judgment again. And he says, I would spare Noah again if Noah were here. As we look in the life of Noah, chapter 6, verse number 9, let's look at verse 8 and 9, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in the generations, and Noah walked with God. Just a few things I want to point out to you this morning. First of all, Noah mastered the most important thing. We know Noah as the one who built a boat. We know Noah uh, as, the, as the man that God preserved. But I want, to, I want us to see, first of all, before Noah ever built a boat, let's look and see what God says about him. And God says that Noah walked with him. Amen. Noah mastered the most important thing. And friend, may I remind you and may I remind me this morning that the most important thing we do as a Christian, the most important thing we do as a dad, the most important thing you may do as a mother, the most important thing you may do as a Sunday school teacher, the most important thing you may do singing in the choir, the most important thing you may do as a preacher and as a pastor is spend time with God. 
Oh, we know how busy we get. And we all have busy ministries. And sometimes I find myself saying, I've got to stop. And I've got to spend time with God. That's the most important thing. Mom and Dad, this morning, if you can't provide the things that you'd like to provide for your family, you provide them a parent that walks with God. You provide them a parent who has a walk with the Lord, who spends time in the Word of God, who has a prayer life. Friend, I'm thankful for the heritage that I have. I'm thankful for a godly mom and a godly dad. I'm thankful for godly grandparents who I know prayed and know spent time with God. And friend, Noah was was spared because he mastered the most important thing. God comes to know as we know and says, I will have some instruction for you. This is going to be a very simple statement. But that wasn't the first time God and Noah talked. Wasn't the first time they had a conversation. Wasn't the first time they spent time together. Friend, may we be reminded to Fellowship daily with the Lord. I, I, I make another observation from the life of Noah. As we see in verse 8 and 9, we know Noah found grace. God then references the generations of Noah. And when God searched the world, that world that he would destroy. And I look, look at our world today. And how wicked and vile it is. And we know what the end is going to be. How wicked did that day have to be? For God to destroy it. And we are reminded as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. But I notice as he references the generations when God searched the world and God looked into the heart of every man, he found a heart in Noah that was different. He found a family that was different. And might I mention the second observation I make that I think made Noah great in the eyes of God is the fact that Noah and his family were the exception. God destroyed the world except for Noah and his family. Except for those that were different. See, friend, you and I need to change our mindset about being the exception. About our children not fitting in with everything in this world. And young people, don't be upset, those that are in the service this morning, don't be upset because mom and dad wants you to be different. It was the exception that spared Noah and his family. It's the fact they were different that they found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And when God chastises a people and God passes his judgment on a nation, he's looking for those that are different. He's looking for the homes that are different. And friend, you and I need to get back to a place where we want to be the exception from this world. They lived in a way that was pleasing to God. I think we forget many times as Christians that we're supposed to be a contrast to the world. Well, may I just say this morning as personal testimony, I've gotten to a place in my life where I'm okay being the exception. I'm okay being the King James Church in town. I, I'm okay with that. I, I'm okay with, with being the soul winning church, the, the separated church. I'm okay with that. <clears throat> I don't run from the name Independent Fundamental Baptist. I'm, I'm okay with my heritage. I'm okay with the previous generation that, that stood and faithfully preached the Word of God. And, and boy, I appreciate the references already to, you don't have to spit on a previous generation because you have some disagreement. Friend, look at what they did and look at what they stood by and look who they served. And, and I, I'm okay being the exception today as a, as a second generation preacher who pastors the same church my father pastored. I'm okay giving honor to him. I'm okay giving honor to that previous generation. When all the other contemporaries go another way, I'm okay being the exception because it is the exception that finds favor with God. No one his families were the exception. I say very quickly, number three, this is probably the most obvious 
statement I'll make about Noah is Noah had great faith. Very quickly, let's reference verses 14 through 17 of Genesis 6, make thee an ark of gopher wood. This is, of course, verse 13. We find God speaking to Noah, telling him what he's going to do. Can you imagine? We, we, we see the signs of the times, and we draw a conclusion of what God's doing. We read the Bible. We make the application. God came to Noah and said, Hey, Noah, this is a good way for you to start your day. I'm going to destroy everything. Probably has Noah's attention. Then he says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms that shalt, thou shalt make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is verse 15, this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. He gives him the length. He gives him the, the, the breadth, the height. He tells him how many windows, where to put them. I hope Noah's taking notes. He tells him, you're going to build a great boat. Then you're going to put all of the living creatures in it. And Noah's got to be thinking, where is this going, Lord? Because it's going to rain. Now, I'm from Florida. It rains every day. You can set your clock by the time that it's going to rain. We see rain all the time. Noah had never seen rain. Yeah, right, right. The world had never seen rain. Right. Noah, as he heard God's commands, please don't miss this, they could not be humanly discerned. That's right. This is the problem I see amongst Christians today. We take God's commands, we try and filter them through our own discernment. And if I understand it, then I'll do it. But friend, there's some things in here that don't make sense. I'll use a simple illustration that every preacher in here understands. You get that new Christian and they want to grow and they get to the fact of, of tithing and giving. And, and Well, Pastor, I can't even pay my bills now. How am I going to pay my bills? You just obey God and God will take care of you. I mean, that's good preaching. That's easy to say. But when you filter that through your own mind, that don't make sense. How in the world was he to discern what God had commanded him to do? And might I just say, uh, preacher, if, if God leads you to do something in ministry, just do what God has commanded you to do. And just do it the way God's telling you to do it. And, and, and recently, God has, God has opened some avenues of ministry for us. And I've had people tell, tell me, well, I, independent Baptists have never had a ministry like that before. I mean, the Lord just, just gave us, if you'll allow me to testify for just a moment. We, we've been praying. We have an aviation ministry we're getting started, and we've been praying for an aircraft, and God just gave us a 737 jet. It's plush. You say, you're bragging. You know, I, I had to deal with that. God get, drops a $5 million aircraft on us, and I don't have time to tell the story. And it's from a, a millionaire had it. He converted it, bought it from Southwest Airlines, converted what would seat 200 people, now seats 35, so you can imagine the leg room you got on that thing. <laughs> Boy, I was struggling with that. At, at, man, I'm, I'm embarrassed to show these pictures. Then I got to thinking, why would I be embarrassed about what God's doing? <laughs> Why would I be embarrassed about God giving something like that? Well, we don't have that. Why not? We do now. But well, we've even had some drop us support because, well, it's obvious that you couldn't, you don't know what to, what are you going to do with that? I'm like, I'll tell you what, I'll just go back to God and say, God, you did something too big. You need to take it back. Obviously, you don't know what you're doing. Can you imagine living that day as Noah was building that boat? And I understand he, the, the, he was the only one, the only family. And by the way, you think you're an exception in your town? How about being the only ones in the whole world that live right? The only ones in the whole world who worship God. The only ones in the whole world who serve Him. They were all by themselves. I understand that, but could you imagine if, if this took place in our day? You, you'd have the brethren come along and say, huh. What in the world are you doing building a boat? Well, it's going to rain. It's never rained. What is rain? You know, can we just be reminded that the same God 
who was in this day is still the same God today. And there, there are th we need to wrap our mind around this. God tells him to build a boat because of what he was going to do. And God may impress upon you to start a ministry because of what he's going to do and what he, what he, what he plans to do. And we just need to step out by faith. And he trusted God amongst the naysayers. He followed him. I'll give you number four, and this is where I, I'll spend the remaining of my time. All of these things certainly speak to my heart. But there's a truth that I find here that I have to say it has had to grab the heart of God. As God gives all of these instructions, and I remind you, Noah couldn't YouTube right. how to build an ark. Right. <laughs> he couldn't do it. I hope he was taking good notes. But you think of that, and he tells him everything to do. A very informative verse is verse 22 of chapter 26. Thus did Noah, according to some that God commanded him, According to that which made sense to him. According to all that God commanded him, so did he. This is a big deal because, I don't know about you, even when I follow instructions putting something together, I usually have parts left over. But God gave these divine instructions and then God gives us testimony and commentary that we can read today that Noah did all, everything I commanded him to do. God says it again in verse number 5, and Noah did according unto all the Lord commanded him. Let me give you this truth about Noah that I believe made Noah great. Noah paid attention to details. You and I must pay attention to details. We can't get sloppy with the commands of God. These who set themselves up today and decide this is what we should do and this is what we shouldn't do. Simple question, who made you God? Well, this isn't important today. I can't tell you how many times through the last few years I've had somebody tell me, well, we live in a new day, and, and this shouldn't be emphasized today, and, 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 and this isn't this important. I, I, wanna, I look at my Bible and I say, yeah, God hadn't told that out yet. So, so it's still in there. But think of this with me. The ark did not come pre-assembled. Noah had to go find some gopher wood. He didn't go down to Home Depot. He fell some trees. He planed some boards. He gathered everything that he needed. In the midst of the mockery, in the midst of the weight of what God had asked him to do. Day after day after day. If Noah was like us, and he certainly is in the respect that he's flesh and blood, he has shortcomings, his physical body would get tired, his mind would get weary, perhaps his spirit would get discouraged. You can picture with me for a moment. Perhaps there was a day when Noah had been working all day. He comes home. He had faced some mockery that day. His body was weary. Maybe he said to himself, I'm not going back out there tomorrow. I don't even know what rain is. What What's... God's really going to destroy the whole world? Kind of like sometimes we say, 
Do these people who live in this city really depend on me? But I imagine when his heart, maybe he had pretty much decided, I'm not going back another day. That he would see the faces of his children. Not only did that ark, was it necessary for his own life, it was necessary for the life of his children. And friend, I'm afraid there are a lot of preachers, there are a lot of parents, there are a lot of Christians in general who are putting their loved ones at risk because they're not paying attention to the details. Because if you're shut up in a boat, the last thing you wanted to do on day 10 is spring a leak because you're shortcut. The last thing you want to take place when the lives of your children are at stake is for you to think back to the times where, well, I just didn't feel like paying attention to what God said. And, 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 and instead of, uh, uh, of doing things the way God said do it, well, somebody told me there's a way to get this boat built faster and there's a way to do it a little bit better and, 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 and a little more modern. And, and boy, you spring a leak because your children are at stake. I wasn't there, obviously. Nobody was there, obviously. But I'm just telling you how I think it happened. There's that old saying amongst those that, that do this kind of work. You, you, you measure twice, cut once. I bet he measured four or five times. One, because God had said. And two, because this is going to keep my family safe. Yeah. This is going to preserve my family. And friend, you and I, we need to pay attention to all the details that God has put in His book. And we don't understand as a parent why He instructs us to do every little thing He does, but you just need to keep in mind, if God said it, it's important. As the pastor of the Emmanuel Baptist Church of Jacksonville, I don't get an opinion on what to do with God's people. I don't get an opinion on how to build a work for the Lord. I don't get an opinion of what what I should preach and how I should preach it and, and what of the, the old time religion I'm to set aside because it's outdated or, or what of what we do should be put up on the shelf. I must pay attention to the details because the future, the life, the livelihood, the happiness, the joy, the preservation is at stake. The whole world, the human race was at risk. And friend, may we understand God hasn't given me grandchildren yet. But I understand this when he does, a lot of their future depends on details. God is blessing our, our, our church like he obviously is here. And we've got people in space everywhere. And we am often reminded of those babies that are in the nursery. that the details Amen. the details are going to determine if they got a Bible preaching church to attend Amen. what made Noah great there's a lot of things that made Noah great but he paid attention to the details God tells Ezekiel I'm that line's crossed and once it's crossed. There's nothing that will turn it back. But I would, I would not, to make a point, he says, if Noah was here, Daniel was here, and Job was here, I still wouldn't preserve the land. I'd preserve them. Right. Right. Fred, I can't stop the hand of God's judgment any more than you can. But this Bible tells me, and these men give an example, Amen. that there are some things that you and I can do. Yeah, right. yeah. He might preserve us. Yeah, preserve our families. Yeah, Bless preserve our churches. Yeah. Preserve our homes. Yeah. Boy, may we, may we seek the favor of God. Yeah. Yeah. May we seek His will. Yeah. His word.
I can't, I can't change Washington, D.C. I get one vote. That's it. And by the way, I tell this to people sometimes, and, and they seem confused by it. The devil's not intimidated by your voter registration card. But he is intimidated by your church attendance. He is intimidated by your prayer life. He is intimidated by, by your, your following of this book. May we seek the favor of God again. Father, help us to seek you. Help us to stay faithful to you. Father, thank you for this church, these men. And Father, may you spare our land. May we buy some time, a space of grace. Maybe once again be willing to be an exception to this world. May we realize that we are supposed to be the exception to this world. And Father, may we live to please you. We ask this in Jesus' name.